Hey everyone, welcome back to the oil fields. So, finally doing a in-depth video on the homemade hydrostatic uh, waze system that is the x-axis for the diamond turning lathe. Uh, we're going to go into a bit more detail today about how it works, how it was designed, how it's all made, and how it's going to integrate into the lathe itself. So. This is it here. Uh, as you can see, it's a boxway style construction where there's bearing pads on all four sides of a rail here. There's four rectangular pads per side. All of them are identical as, as far as their geometry. And they're all orifice compensated. Uh, rectangular pads that look just like this. So there's the recess for the oil pressure to build in. And then this threaded hole in the center here is where the orifice goes. The orifice is just, this is an early custom one we made. It's a stainless steel set screw with a hole drilled in it like that. Just seals with that cone point against a lip on the inside of the, the pad. The only difference between this one and the ones in the final are the set screws, the orifices actually are installed from the top so we can access them uh, without having to take the whole, you know, carriage apart. And then that port there is just a pressure monitoring port for this, this prototype. So, you know, I mean, there was a lot of math and I made a little MATLAB code to design, to, you know, figure out how, how big everything needs to be in that, but we won't go into that um, today. Um, but uh, other things, so as you can see, this axis is driven by a linear motor. It's an ironless slot type. And the benefit there is we don't have any cogging forces, which is nice. Um, the magnet track is bolted to the the rail, and then you can see the forcer down in there. And the cable is just coming out the side here. Uh, the rail itself is 1018 steel, just regular mild steel. Uh, ground quite nicely on the uh, on the Herrig. This whole thing, the whole rail is flat, parallel, and square to about a micron at its max all over. So frankly, I was hoping for a little bit better, but that was really asking a lot. This is a foot long uh, and not being very experienced in grinding myself, that's as best as I could do with the old Herrig that we have. So that's what we're going with. We can always compensate out uh, errors in the travel straightness, you know, in software in theory. The pads, themselves going around. This is actually made out of uh, 304 stainless and that was a tremendous mistake for a multitude of reasons. Um, super tricky to get this to grind well. There's a ton of internal stresses, zero ther thermal conductivity, and a relatively high coefficient of thermal expansion for, uh, for a, a steel at least. So it, all that makes for really, really awful time trying to get things flat. Lots of warping and moving around, and you got to be super careful with uh, the heat you're putting into the part. Um, but the real reason that that was not a great choice is you have a difference in thermal expansion between the, you know, the carriage and the the rail. So what that means is the gap right now is set as one thou. But as the you know ambient temperature increases uh, beyond you know what it was when it was assembled, that gap's going to change, and that's really not great. But there was a lot of reasons why we ended up going with uh, 304. A lot of constraints uh, that sort of forced us down that route, and so now we just have to pay the price of being careful with our environmental control to prevent that from changing too much. Now that coefficient is not actually too crazily high, but 
it's there and it's not very good precision engineering but you know hindsight is 2020 so as I just mentioned there you heard the the design gap and uh, so all the all the oil films is one thou uh, for these side plates that's set inherently in the grinding by grinding the pads a thou lower than this face here where they bolt bolt up against the top and bottom the top and bottom are match ground with the rail so these are exactly the same width width and then that pad is just ground a thou lower and that sets the gap there the gaps for the top and bottom were actually set with shims believe it or not uh, you can get shim stock omnic master which is accurate uh, to plus or minus 50 millionths so ended up just cutting some little slips of shims putting them under all the bearing pads during assembly clamping it bolting it together and then pulling the shims out um, so a little bit of a jank way of doing that but seems to be working all right so far um, other things here so you can see the the nightmare of of tubing we got going on um, we got these new banjo fittings here which make the tubing management a little bit better than it was in that shorter clip I posted but it's still uh, it's still gonna be tricky lots of this is probably gonna have to be suspended something like this to prevent all sorts of forces dragging this thing around um, can't be having any drag chains so that's that the spindle mounts here there's two clamps in the back which I'll show some other time and a pretty unique clamping system on the front where a set screw coming in from here drives the clamp downwards but again I'll we'll look at that when we look at the spindle you'll notice this top surface is ground here but not that back there that's because right here is the where the encoder scale is going to mount or the, the piece of metal that will have the encoder scale mounted to it so this needs act these this actually needs to be uh, accurately ground with respect to the rail and all the other surfaces but that's what that's why that's like that um, I got some questions about the hydraulic supply and that's it right there uh, turns out there's a relatively thriving business of um, small-scale remote control uh, construction equipment like hydraulic, you know, like excavators and whatnot, and they run off real hydraulic pumps, and this is one of them. So it's a really cute little guy. It's got a built-in built, built -in reservoir here. Um, there's a pressure uh, regulation valve on the top. You can see the gauge right there. And then it's all driven just with a little, uh, little BLDC motor, and we just have a little servo tester that we're using to control the speed of it dial in the pressure with the valve on top and that uh, that's able to put out about 300 psi and feed feed all these bearings here so that's how we're doing the hydraulics it's just going through uh, a little filter and then up to this octopus of a manifold to feed all 16 bearing pads so that is that is the rail there uh, now let's take a quick look at how it all mounts up to the machine because obviously right now we've just got it in this testing bed thing container where all the oil just recycles and goes back into the uh, the pump but let's look at how this is, this mounts up to the machine so here we can see where it's going to mount up um, on the the x-axis here there's the z-axis that I show I've shown before and basically it's just going to bolt between these two plates uh, which are bolted to the side of this surface plate here so the surface plate and you'll notice this one's not bolted on yet the surface plate has its flat side down against the base which is another surface plate and these these sides are ground square with that and parallel with each other so that's parallel to that and then same deal with this front face here. That's square to that, square to the bottom, and also very flat. Uh, and believe it or not, we did this on the Haas of all machines. 
Uh, it's not perfect, but we were able to get these, you know, flat to approximately 60 millionths and parallel to around the same. So really not bad um, and, and well within tolerance for what we're trying to do here, um, which you can see why in a, in a moment. So we've got one fixed plate, which bolts on, we've got a couple of threaded inserts epoxied in there. But then you'll notice this one's got a bit of a something different going on, and this one's actually bolted on already. Um, you know, if if the rail and the plate were not exactly the same length, and both of these plates were solid, three quarter inch stainless, and we were trying to bolt that all together, that's super super over constrained, and you've got a very large force fighting a very immovable object and so things are going to bend a lot it's going to tend to bow the the rail which we ground all nice and straight in all sorts of undesirable ways so the idea here is we've cut some flex screws into this this side so any mismatch in the length of the rail and the plate because these are just ground perfectly flat is taken up by that flexure there and it should allow this face to remain relatively parallel and not want to bend the rail all about but it will take up any any slop um, where we weren't able to match that perfectly which you know it's not particularly difficult to match those to within you know a thou or so but you still want that last little bit taken out by some something pretty compliant like that and this will remain extremely stiff you know, up and down, so, and in this direction as well. So it really just gives a bit of compliance in the x-axis um, and allows everything to go together with slightly less over constraint. Uh, and then this pocket on the top is sort of the, the oil management system here. It's really just not gonna be anything high-tech at all. It will just drain back down and then get funneled out, funneled out here, and sort of return to tank back under the bottom there. Stuff still needs to get figured out in that department, but that's how it's gonna mount up. And the spindle will go on top. Obviously it's, it's facing the wrong way right now, but that's that's the idea there. Let's take a quick look at, uh, at those bearings running, and then I'll show off some results from a quick stiffness test we did. So now we're pumps off, we're sitting here, it's, this thing doesn't want to move at all. I'll go ahead and turn the, turn the pump up and immediately it's going to try and fall off on us. So I'll try and hold that in place while turning up the pump with my other hand here. All right, and now we're now we're at good operating pressure, and you can see this thing is, it's floating. So the cables are still, or the tubing is still dragging on the, the back of the container here a bit, but it is most definitely hydrostaticing. Um, you can see the oil coming off it there. It's kind of a mess, but that's sort of what you sign up for with hydrostatics unless you want to build a fancy air seal oil recovery system, which we intended to, but we didn't really have the space with this amount of area to, to make it work. But you can see it's sliding around quite nicely. You can just feel there's a, there's a good bit of, of damping there. Um, but yeah, so I'm pretty pleased with that. Uh, we'll, we're going to play around with this a little bit more uh, and then get it all cleaned up and, and mounted on the, the rail itself, or the, the base itself, and then get everything guarded up and, and ready to run. Um, so that's about it. Uh, real quick, I'll just throw in a clip of some stiff, stiffness testing we did. Um, it wasn't conclusive or frankly even that empirical seeing as the indicator didn't get a reading but 
Um, that's why we're gonna, we're gonna do more testing on it, and I think it's a sign of, of good results to come. So I'll go ahead and throw that up real quick, and uh, until, until next time, thanks for watching. Okay, stiffness test. Observe the indicator right about at eight. We'll take a old blockhead stator, put it on, and basically no movement. Take it off. No movement there. So we're gonna need a more sensitive indicator, but this is 10.7 pounds as we just weighed it. And Best test isn't picking anything up, so I'd say that's a good sign.